Hello friends, in this video we will be looking at the editorials which came in the Hindu newspaper on the third week of January. The first article which we are going to look at is titled Aadhaar enabling a form of super surveillance which came on the 16th of January. This is a very critical article, it is very critical about Aadhaar and it criticizes all aspects of it right from the passing of the Aadhaar bill to its implementation and the consequences it has on civil liberties. First, let's look at the origin of Aadhaar. Even though we talk about Aadhaar right now, you should know that the idea was actually mooted in January 2009 and it is then that UIDAI was established. What is UIDAI? It is UIDAI means Unique Identification Authority of India. So what was it supposed to do? It tried to identify residents of India, not just citizens, all residents using biometric information. So what is this biometric information? You see, they take fingerprints and iris scan. Fingerprint and the iris are unique to individuals. So when they combine the both of them along with a number, it makes it a very unique biometric identification. And what was the mooted purpose for having this Aadhaar scheme? It was said that it is for proper distribution of benefits and subsidies of the government and plugging the leakages in the system. So this is the reason why Aadhaar was introduced and for no other reason. Moving on, if you look at the initial implementation of Aadhaar, we see that there was no Aadhaar legislation and the data was collected without any safeguards and people were forced to give away their private information. And what happens? If you don't give, if you don't give those private information, it meant that they cannot receive the benefits of government schemes. This was the case for Aadhaar until the Supreme Court intervened. The Supreme Court said that the Aadhaar scheme should be treated as voluntary only and not having an Aadhaar, a unique ID Aadhaar, doesn't mean that a person can be denied a service by the government. So after this, the Aadhaar legislation happened, which is on March 2016. Aadhaar targeted delivery of financial and other subsidies, benefits and services bill. So here you should note that this bill was categorized as a money bill. So let's try to learn something about the money bill. You see in the legislature, a bill has to pass through the lower house, the Lok Sabha and the upper house, the Rajya Sabha and then get the assent from the president before it becomes a law. So money bill is special in the sense that it doesn't require the support of Rajya Sabha to be passed and, to be passed and made, made as a law. Rajya Sabha can only make recommendations but it cannot make amendments. So why did the government do this? Because the ruling party BJP does not enjoy a majority in the Rajya Sabha. Since it wanted the bill to be passed in the legislature, it decided to name it as a money bill, thereby bypassing any probable dead end in the Rajya Sabha. And this aspect was heavily criticized by the legislature, all the parties and throughout the country. But what did this bill do? This bill retrospectively legitimized all UIDIA actions which means anything that has been done before in the name of collecting personal data was made legitimate. And also this bill still terms Aadhaar as voluntary only. So what is the problem now? You see even though it says voluntary, there is still coercion of people into giving their personal data because now it says that you should link your bank account, your PAN card, your ration card, your mobile number and many more services to your Aadhaar Otherwise, they will be deactivated or frozen. So this is indirectly forcing people to come and register with the UIDAI. Now, there are four questions. Can the state compel a person to part with a, his or her biometric data? And what about the possibility of surveillance using this data? And what is the level of exclusion caused by Aadhaar? and is the data safe? We will look at each one of them individually. But before that, 
I will talk about exclusion a little bit because what happens is when you mandate the people to follow the norms set by UIDAI in order to avail government services, what happens is some people are left out of getting the benefits of government schemes. So in that aspect, there are cases reported where people have people's names have been excluded from the ration cards uh, and other services. Now let's look at the first issue which is can the state compel? So you see, the author argues that this act violates the fundamental rights, especially Article 21, which promises right to life with dignity and, and bodily integrity, which means that the people can decide how they want to lead their lives. Now, how can one be free to lead a life that they desire if the government always has an option to watch them or to survive them? And as a consequence of the first point, the author also says that this grants massive invasive powers to the state, intrusion into the privacy of an individual. So what does these two implicitly mean? It means that our fingerprints don't belong to us, but to the government and it will insist on expropriating our identity as a precondition for it to do its job. The next aspect is super surveillance. You see, surveillance means close observation of someone suspected to be a spy or a criminal. Super surveillance is an enhanced form of surveillance. The author argues that this act enables a form of super surveillance by the government on the people. It permits a perfect police state creation and it allows the government or at least it potentially gives a premise for the government to track every one of us in real time. This is possible because we have already linked our mobile number through which you can find a person's location, you can listen to them, you can tap them. This is because we have given our mobile number and we have linked our bank accounts and every other aspect of our daily life. The question again is, how can an individual be truly free? People find it very hard to let their guard down if they know that someone is always watching them. So what are the consequences of this? There is a severe loss of civil liberties and there is definitely loss of privacy and which means that by default the state will be starting to treat everyone as criminals. Now let's look at UIDAI itself. UIDAI has two conflicting responsibilities. One is it is the custodian of all the information that it collects. It is also the regulator of the database. It seems like both these functions, if it is vested in the same body, it makes the job easier. But you should understand that this is a conflict of interest. If there is any breach in the collected information, a regulator, which is usually a separate individual autonomous body, will have to, will usually look into this. In, in this case, since UIDAI is itself the regulator, we might never even know if there is a breach. That is the implication of this conflict of interest. Because any breach will be known only to the UIDI and the remedy for that breach is also left to the UIDI because it is the regulator. It will also give the remedy by itself and we will not have any say in that. Then there is the problem of exclusion. You see, biometric data, the fingerprint and the iris comes with a lot comes with a series of flaws because sometimes even if you have registered your biometric data there are chances that it may not be recognized due to several reasons so when people who are reliant on pds for food grain pds here is public distribution system on food grains they will suffer the most if this technical flaw happens and they are excluded from the system which means that even though they have all they have done everything that the government has asked they may not get the food grains which is a basic necessity for them to survive so that is a serious issue and fingerprints from elderly manual laborers who have worked a lot usually it is difficult to record the fingerprints from them because they are blue collared laborers and their fingerprints are usually very worn out so elderly also suffer seriously because of this flaws of biometric system what is the final assertion or even you can say accusation the author levies on this scheme? The author says that while Aadhaar can bring about benefits, 
the aim of the government seems to be to create a po seamless police state. This is the final conclusion that the author arrives at. Moving on to the next article, it is titled Why Soaking the Rich Won't Work, which came on the 16th of January. This is an article on the economics topic. And what is this article about? This article says that high taxation of the rich is not the solution. Before we move on, let's try to understand the word soaking. Soaking generally means wetting something thoroughly. But in this article, soaking here means imposing high taxes. So soaking the rich means high taxation of the rich. That is the meaning of the title. Let's move on to the next slide. What is the rationale behind high taxes? High income individuals already earn enough income to keep them working hard. They say that the usual rationale is if since they are already earning a lot of money, they will still be motivated to earn more even if their taxes are high. But if the high income individuals can escape from the high tax region and move to a low tax region, then the point of introducing higher tax for these individuals becomes void. There was a study conducted in the US and it says that star scientists tend to move out of states with higher tax rates into states with lower tax rates. So what does star scientist here means? Star scientist here means they are highly productive. They have multiple patents and they earn enough to be in the top 1% of the taxpayers in the US. So these are the star scientists, which means that since they have these qualities, it means that these star scientists can generate a lot of revenue for the state. And it is these scientists which move out of states when there is a higher tax in, the, in, the, in their original, uh, in their home state to a state where there is lower taxes. And they also noted that when the tax rate was lowered in a state enough to increase the income of these star scientists by 1%, the number of such scientists residing in that state increased by 0.4% and to 0.18% in the long run. So what do we? We understand that everybody including the people who are rich like to keep the fruits of their labor. Nobody wants to pay higher taxes to the government. As the supporters of progressive taxes say, high taxes need not necessarily bring in more revenue and need not be good in the long run. So taxing the rich is not necessarily going to help us in facing and solving the problems of globalization. Moving on to the next article, it is titled Following the Grain Trail, which came on the 17th of January. So what is this article about? This article has done a case study on Jharkhand around the issues with Aadhaar, PDS and DBT linking. Aadhaar, PDS means Public Distribution System, the ration shops and DBT. DBT means Direct Benefit Transfer. So first let's look at the directive. The Jharkhand government made Aadhaar based biometric authentication compulsory for its PDS users. Earlier in the first article we talked about how Aadhaar linkages has been happening for many services like banks, mobile numbers and ration cards. This article deals with Aadhaar linkage of the Aadhaar linking with ration cards. So, so the Jharkhand government made the, uh, the Aadhaar based biometric authentication mandatory for all PDS users which means anybody who wants to come to the ration shop and buy food grains has to have linked their Aadhaar with their family ration cards. So before uh, we jump in just look at the uh, map here. This is Jharkhand and uh, just a quick look at the states around. This is West Bengal, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar. So these are the states around Jharkhand and this is where Jharkhand is located. So 
what were the consequences of this directive that we saw there was large scale exclusion especially of elders and widows which are the most vulnerable sections of the society and there were serious biometric and connectivity failures and also this led to the revival of corruption which means when there is exclusion of data those people's entitled food grains were siphoned off and they were distributed outside into the open market what were the specifics of the disaster there was a mass cancellation of this ration card which was amounting to 11 lakh cards and the state government itself accepts that this 11 lakh number seems to be large and some of the valid cards were also deleted for no fault of theirs also monthly ration of 5 kg per person were restricted only to those whose Aadhaars were linked with the ration card which means for instance in a family of 5 people 5 kg per person means 5 into 5 kg is 25 kilogram of food grains per month now of these 5 people only 3 people have linked their Aadhaar number to their family ration card which means that the ration shop will give only as for the 3 people which is 3 into 5 kilogram they will be getting only 15 kilogram of food grains while they get 15 kilograms of food grains there are still two people in that family and their only fault is they have not linked their Aadhaar with the ration card and for this they have to suffer so this is a problem with the uh, linking of Aadhaar then the third point is there is a complex unclear tiresome roundabout roundabout dbt for this pds system which we will look at the new dbt pds system is very complex and unclear for the people of jharkhand they first introduced this in the nagri block of ranchi district and they introduced here because this place is relatively well developed so implementing such a pilot project will be a good idea to see how it fares a new experiment was practiced here which is earlier the price of 1 kilogram of rice was rupees 1 now it was made as 32 rupees but what the plan is the government will give this money to the people and people can take this money and buy it using the 32 rupees per kg uh, formula from the ration shops and so at the end of the day the people will not be spending this amount the government will be giving this amount this was the original idea what the government did was they made this process into three steps first the people have to go to their bank and check whether the subsidy the subsidy amount is credited into their bank account then they have to go to the pragya kendra from where they have to withdraw that subsidy amount and after withdrawing it they will have to go to the ration shop with that cash and ask for their food grains so this is a very very tedious process for the people of this nagri block the adaptation of this process is itself very difficult and for them the pragya kendra or the bank is usually very far away so no matter who they are whether they are a widow they are an elderly or they are a family of four they had to travel so much of distance in order to follow the steps laid out by the government and also usually the people have to run to the bank in order to check whether the subsidy was credited when people have several bank accounts even the bank manager is finding it difficult to understand to which account the subsidy amount is credited to ultimately the result is people with cash are able to go to the ration, car, ration shops and buy food grains without any hassle which means the government by introducing that three step process has actually forced the people to use cash the irony here is Jharkhand government wanted to announce this Nagri block as the first cashless block of Jharkhand and now their own measures have made the people to use more cash what are the other impacts of forcing this dbt this problem of using the direct benefit transfer and linking it with Aadhaar is not specific to that of ration shops only there are cases where pensions were discontinued for the senior citizens and they were not even told what the reasons were they don't even know what the reasons are and job cards are cancelled simply to say that they have met the 100% seeding targets 
cash payments are linked or redirected to this Aadhaar linked bank accounts and this is something that the people are still illiterate about. So what is the overarching issue that we can learn from this article? The thing is there is a growing centralization and technocracy in the country and people are being treated as guinea pigs for this undependable technologies without any effective arrangements for grievance redressal or even information sharing. This shows that there is a lack of concern by the government on the hardships faced by the people because the state is still forcing the people to adopt other based technology. Moving on to the next article which is titled All Gore which came on the 17th of January. What is this article about? This article talks about the difficulties in regulating Jallikattu. So what is Jallikattu? In Tamil it is called Yeru Tharuvudal. Yeru means the bull, Tharuvudal means hugging. But for all practical purposes we can refer to it as bull taming. Jallikattu is organized as a part of the Pongal celebrations during the Maattu Pongal day. Now we know that Jallikattu has been having serious debates and discussions around the country over several years. We will look at the background first. You see, AWBI, Animal Welfare Board of India, files a case in the Supreme Court to ban this port of Jallikattu. In 2010, the Supreme Court asks the Tamil Nadu government to make sure that there is no cruelty to the bulls because this was the accusation by Animal Welfare Board of India. In 2011, the Environment Ministry denotified bulls as performing animals. This means that the sport is effectively banned by the actions of Environment Ministry. But the sport still continued under the TN Regulation of Jallikat Act 2009. But in 2014, the Supreme Court struck down this law and banned Jallikattu altogether. And it says that penalty for conducting Jallikattu and any other cruelty to the bulls will come under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, which is also called as PCA Act of 1960. It also directed the government to bring bulls under the ambit of PCA. It asked the government to amend PCA and bring these bulls under the ambit of PCA. On 8th January 2016, the Environment Ministry ended the ban under certain conditions. But on the 14th January, again, the Supreme Court upheld the ban after a petition was filed by the Animal Welfare Board of India and PETA, which is another NGO. And in January 2017, there were huge protests across Tamil Nadu, especially in Chennai, for ensuring that the sport of Jallikattu takes place. And after this happened, the governor of Tamil Nadu issued a new ordinance that authorized the continuation of Jallikattu because there was a fear that this protest can go out of hand and the law and order would be derailed in the state. So this is the so the government did this, and on the 23rd January 2017 which is last year, Tamil Nadu government passed a bill with the accession of the Prime Minister exempting Jallikattu from the PCA Act of 1960. So this was the background for Jallikattu. And after this, this year Jallikattu took place legally and what was the problems faced during this year's event? You see, there were still cruelty to the bulls and there were death of bystanders, there were numerous violations of due procedure which was laid down by the district officials and there were many disorderly conduct because there were many people who let loose the bull in un earmarked areas and there was also the problem of hyper excited miscreants who are very difficult to contain. So what do we learn from this article? The article states that Jallikattu is very difficult to regulate and uh, nothing much has changed on the ground. That is a sad fact. Moving on to the next article which is titled Open Trafficking. What is this article about? This article talks about cross-border human trafficking from Nepal to India. So in 2015, there was an earthquake, a severe earthquake in Nepal, which 
killed more than 9,000 people. And SSB, the Sashastra Seema Bal, India's Central Reserve Police Force, says that human trafficking actually increased by threefold after this earthquake. And most of them are minors, and their destination countries are Kyrgyzstan, Israel, West Asia, which is the Gulf countries, and India as well. First of all, let's try to understand why they are traveling through India. Because India and Nepal have an open border policy. This is due to the Indo-Nepal Treaty of Peace and Friendship. So what does this uh, treaty do? This treaty allows free movement of people and it also makes sure that India and Nepal collaborate in the matters of defense and foreign policy. This act has always been under severe criticisms from the people of Nepal because they feel that this is a very unequal treaty and it, imp it infringes upon Nepal's sovereignty. And the Indian government recently has made sure, has ensured Nepal that it is willing to review this treaty as per today's needs. So the author gives a short term solution for this, which is closing the border. But the problem is closing the border might actually aggravate the economic hardships of the people who are living around the border area and who are doing business with cross border trade. There is long term solution which is to create economic opportunities for the youth of Nepal, within Nepal. And enhancing intelligence networks and border monitoring mechanisms on the Indian side in order to prevent such human trafficking. Moving on to the next article, which is titled, Taking over a law. So what is this article about? This article talks about having an open, transparent public debate about the functioning of the judiciary and it has suggestions on how to reform it. So this article has come in the wake of uh, the conference, the press conference that the four senior most Supreme Court judges gave against the Chief Justice of India. So what is the story? First, the judges say that they were forced to break their settled principle of judicial restraint. It means whatever problems are present within the judiciary, they will have to be resolved within the within the collegium system or within their judges themselves. It usually is not brought to the public eye. When that was the norm, these judges, these four judges actually came out to the press and said that they were very unhappy with the functioning of the Chief Justice of India. And why? Because the Chief Justice of India did not take steps to redress their grievances. What was the point of contention? These four judges argue that all the judges in the top court are equal. A particular judge, which is the CJI in this case, cannot say that he should be given a specific case for hearing. The case here in question is Judge Loya case. So what is the case of Judge Bridgopal Loya? You see, Judge Loya was hearing the Sharabdin Sheikh fake encounter case of 2004. There were many police officers involved in this case who were accused of this fake encounter, taking part in this fake, fake encounter. And the current BJP president, Amit Shah, is also named in the case as an accused. When Judge Loya was dealing with this case, he died under mysterious circumstances in November 2014. And Immediately, the next month in December 2014, Amit Shah was discharged from this case. So, this seems very suspicious to many people and the tipping point was reached when there were two petitions which were demanding a fair probe into this mysterious death of Judge Loya. And for hearing this petition, the Chief Justice listed a judge who is 10th in terms of seniority to hear this petition. And these rebellious judges, the four judges who came and talked to the press, believe that such a serious matter should have been heard by a more senior judge. Why did the Chief Justice give it to someone who is not as senior as nine other people? So this is the background for the current turmoil in the judiciary. Let's, the author of this article deals with all the overarching problems with our judiciary. What are they? The first issue and the foremost issue is lack of transparency. Because the author notes that 
there is an apparent arbitrariness in the way how the CJI deals with handling the disposal of cases. Because the CJI could act whimsically or he could be motivated. But the problem is there is no way to find out whether it was, it was just done as a random act or it was actually motivated. And there is an opaque internal structure, the collegium system, for example, inside the judiciary. There is an unquestioning trust in the office of the CJI, which is the reason why this happens. And any interference by the parliament is not tolerated by the judiciary. See, these are listed as the main lack of transparency issues with the judiciary. What did Ambedkar say? Ambedkar said, no matter how upright the CJI might be, he is still a mortal and he would have frailties. Thus, no absolute power should be vested in him. Of course, he was talking about C CJI veto power in appointing of judges. It is not for allocating of cases, but the author says this same theory, this philosophy can be applied in the case of convention of allocating the benches as well. What is this convention? The CJI decides which judge, which other Supreme Court judges gets to take up which cases. This is a convention which we have adopted from the practice which is followed in the United Kingdom. So why is the judiciary insular? It means why is the judiciary so averse to any interference or any regulation by the parliament or the government? Because such a fear for politicization is a legitimate concern for the judiciary. Since earlier during the emergency, Judge A and Ray was superseded as the CJI by the Indira Gandhi government when there were other senior judges present who should have been considered for CJI because the senior most judge is usually made the CJI, is made the Chief Justice of India. So the fear of political interference or politicization is valid but there is a middle ground between superseding the CJI as it happened before and proposing an accountability law for judges because no matter what accountability has to be reinforced and it has to be maintained even within the judiciary and people should be able to trust the judiciary. If by being insular the judiciary thinks that it, it can evade the political, political interference, the author says that there are still many other nefarious methods using which the politicians can interfere in the judiciary. So what is needed? The author says there is a need for a Supreme Court Act. He says that it should be drafted after an open public discussion involving all the stakeholders which is the government, the judiciary, the civil societies, the people, the public, everybody. And is such a law actually valid because we know that the judiciary has to be independent. There shouldn't be so much of uh, political involvement in the judiciary. So the, does the constitution allow it? Is it constitutionally valid? Yes, says the author because entry 77 of list 1 of the 7th schedule says that powers and jurisdiction of the Supreme Court can possibly be subject to the parliamentary law. So such a proposed law, a Supreme Court Act is constitutionally possible. Why is this act needed? First of all, it is to restructure the judiciary and to rectify this discourse that any parliamentary law related to uh, judiciary is an anathema is an interference and an infringement. It is also to develop institutional coherence within the judiciary. Now the author imagines what should this Supreme Court Act do. First of all, it should restructure the Supreme Court into three benches, admission, appellate and constitutional. What does the admission division do? Admission division will consider all special leave petitions under the article 136. What is special leave petitions? Article 136 allows the Supreme Court to grant special leave to any aggrieved party against an order, judgment or a decree passed by a lower court within the territory of India. That is special leave petition. And the author says that this proposed admission division should consider all those special leave petition appeals. They should comprise of five randomly selected judges and for one quarter every year, these five judges have to deal only with the admission cases. The next is the constitutional division, which should be a 
permanent constitution bench of five senior most justices of the court. They should be listening only to the constitutional cases like that of the privacy case which was dealt, in, dealt last year in the month of August. Then there is a third division called the appellate division and this appellate division will be consisting of the remaining 21 judges with seven three judge benches and they will be listening to all the matters admitted by the admission division which we saw earlier along with other writs and appeals. So what is the conclusion now? The conclusion of the article is that a public conversation is necessary in order to make sure that there is more transparency and to reinforce to the judiciary that it is still a part of a republican constitutional framework and it is not present simply to preserve the lawyers and judges only. So what this means is the judiciary is not infallible and it should also be brought under scrutiny and it should be open to such suggestions. Thank you for watching this video. Please support us by subscribing to our channel and also for more free materials concerning the civil service preparation, please subscribe to our telegram channel listed below.